Hi, I'm Jeff Alex, host of Living Well with MS family of podcasts from Overcoming MS. Hey everyone, Jack McNulty here. Welcome to another new and exciting season of Ask Jack, a special Living Well with MS podcast series. I'm excited and honored to answer food and cooking related questions from you, the Overcoming MS community. To submit a question for future episodes of Ask Jack, please email us at podcast at overcomingms.org. That's podcast at overcomingms.org. Please check out this episode's show notes at overcomingms.org slash podcast and dig into additional information and links on what we'll cover. And now, let's rev up our culinary curiosity and ask Jack. Welcome to the 10th episode of Ask Jack. I can't believe it's 10 episodes. Um, joining us on this episode is Jack Winolti, our um, celebrity chef, and we're going to be discussing the... Um, topic of soups so welcome jack thanks jeff uh yeah i 10 episodes really how, yeah. how did that happen i know <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure you've covered all food now haven't we <laughs> exactly well I, you know soups is uh, one of those things that i think is just an excellent starting point on anybody beginning their oms journey um it's just packed with vegetables fiber rich um they're easy to make oms um, they're easy to make in large quantities if batch cooking is, is your thing. Um, you can freeze a lot of them. I mean, there's just so many good reasons to to begin with soups. And so uh, I'm glad we're tackling that that topic today. So I'll, I'll get straight into it. There's the first question that came up, um, and this, this applies more, probably more, not just to soups, but to more foods. So are there any OMS compliant vegetable stock cubes or powders? They all seem to contain oils because, it, I mean, it is, as a, an amateur chef, it's a such time-saving yeah. thing to, to stick a, a vegetable stock cube in. Yeah, it's, it's, it's always one of those things, you know, which side of the value equation are you going to fall on? Uh, you know, and you always got to weigh uh, how much you want to control all of the ingredients, how much you want to control the taste, versus the time and the cost and uh, ultimately the taste again on the other side of the equation. So it kind of depends on that. In terms of the uh, cubes and, and powders that are available in the market these days, um, I think oil is, is probably your least concern when it comes to those products. I think sodium would be a, a bigger concern. Um, those are usually laden with uh, uh, lots and lots of, of sodium. That's how they keep them on the shelves, um, as well as other chemicals, you know, which are to me are a little bit more concerning. I, I think overall, most of the uh, cubes and powders uh, loosely fall within the guidelines of OMS. So it's perfectly okay to go ahead and use them. Having said that, uh, I think you are giving up a lot of control in terms of the ingredients that you're putting into your food. You're certainly increasing your sodium in many cases, uh, as well as probably some other uh, chemicals and whatnot. You know, it's interesting. When I make my own broth, um, and then you make exactly the same thing using a, a cube or a powder, the first thing that you notice immediately is the aroma is significantly different between the two. And that should actually be a clue as to which one is uh, I would prefer putting in, in my body. Now, in terms of the time element, yeah, a lot of people say, oh, you know, I don't have time to make my own vegetable broth. Well, vegetable broth takes all of maybe 30 minutes to make. It's, you could put it together while watching a sitcom on TV in the background. <laughs> You know, and um, it, it's just one of those things that you can make in a large quantity, uh, always have on hand. You can freeze it easily, and um, it, it doesn't really require a huge effort. In terms of cost, probably not that much more significant than, than buying cubes and, and powders and that sort of thing. There are, I mean, um, in the UK at least, there is a brand that was put on to, to me by another uh, OMS. -er. Um, they're called uh, nine, nine Meals from Anarchy, but they they also now tied up with a celebrity chef here called Hugh Fernie Whittingstall, who does mm -hmm. it, um, who's generally pretty good with his cooking. Um, and they they do seem very good actually. There is all organic vegetables and some, uh, some extra virgin olive oil, and they say half the sodium of um, you know, typical stock cube. So they they seem to be 
pretty good. So there are some. I think it, it, it's yeah. just a lot of shopping around. It's not available in the supermarket, though. So yeah, um, and there are. I agree with the you. There are good quality. Um, decent quality, I should put, uh, stocks and cubes that are out there. But the simple fact is you still have to get that product to sit on a shelf for an extended period of time. Yeah. And in order to do that, you are going to need to have uh, or use things like sodium, but more worrisome, probably some of the other things that are going to go on in that product to create the stability for the shelf life. Well, yeah, I mean, these ones don't have shelf life they're, they are what once you open the jar so yeah. they're the jars because they can i don't know how they do it but jars can keep for a long time and then once you open the jar it's got to be refrigerated and yeah. used so yeah yeah that's the problem yeah whereas the other ones where it's a little box sits in your cupboard for 15 exactly. years exactly. <laughs> and i suspect you're going to be paying a whole lot more for the higher quality one as well oh yeah yeah they're more expensive and yeah. so the question then so, becomes why bother why not just make your own and yeah have it on hand you got to refrigerate it also yeah um so i mean this is uh that we connect to the next question i think you probably answered it what's the benefit of making your stock from scratch so it's saying um control flavor um so yeah so pam shantner was asking um the benefits i think we've probably covered that yeah, um, yeah um just just real quick i mean for those that don't know in terms of making your own vegetable stock. Let me just real real quickly run through how I how I would approach that. So you always want to start out with your aromatic vegetables. And so the most part that's carrots, onions, uh, celery, sometimes leek and sometimes garlic. And you basically just get them cut up. You can chuck them all into a food processor uh, and chop them up fine, in which case you'll you'll get the flavor quicker than if they're cut up in larger chunks. Um, and I always use the skin. You know, you just wash them really well. A lot of the flavor is going to be in the skin, and you're going to you're going to be straining it out anyway at the end of the process. Um, then you can just add other things. Uh, you know, some of the things I like to add to add a lot of color and flavor: is sun dried tomatoes, maybe some a uh, piece of kombu, which is very effective. Uh, parsley, bay leaves, uh, cloves, a little bit of black pepper. Those are things that are important. Sometimes other ingredients, um, virtually any vegetable, really, um, mushrooms, fennel, tomatoes. The only the only vegetable I would stay away from is probably anything that's related to the cabbage family. That's going to add a little bit too much of a of a flavor, a little too strong um, in terms of what you're keeping. What I do is I just bring, um, you know, I, I sort of sweat everything in a small amount of water for maybe 10, 15 minutes. Uh, just to get it all nice and soft. And then I put enough water just to come right up to the top, maybe one or two centimeters above the, the vegetable level, which is about a half inch to an inch. Um, and I bring it up to a, a boil, reduce the heat, uh, cover the pot, and let it simmer for about 45 minutes. That's it. I just turn it off, and then I leave it on the stovetop overnight. Uh, and the reason I do that is it just slowly, it's like making tea. It just slowly infuses all of those flavors. Everything kind of melds together. And the next morning, I just strain it all out. And uh, there I have my stock. It's really a very simple process, and that's how I choose to do it. Okay. And then you can freeze it. Exactly. Store it. Yeah. Portion it. You can put it in ice ice cube trays so you can have a little little ice cubes of vegetable broth, which makes an interesting cocktail, by the way. Um, and so going on from that, um, that, that was a sort of a question of how best to make a story. Would you, would you concentrate it as well? I mean, because you get ones which are highly concentrated. Or yeah. are you, I mean, how concentrated would you make it? If you're gonna yeah, I, I, that's why I cook it with a lid, because concentration is done through evaporation, and I like to control that evaporation. Um, so I find that adding the, the water to the vegetables is key right, right up front. So you don't want to add too much. It'll be just too diluted. Uh, but if you just go right up to the top of the vegetables, um, there's really no reason then to concentrate it. Uh, and, of course, you're not, you, you don't have any seasoning in there. There's no fat in there whatsoever. Um, and it, it lives perfectly well overnight at room temperature without any problem whatsoever. Um, and, and I don't find that there's a reason to 
reduce it down or concentrate it uh, for making a soup or, or a stew or for whatever use you're, you're planning on having the, the vegetable stock for. I find actually it's just delicious on its own as a soup in itself, you know, just to have a glass of it, which is what I tend to do after straining it out. <laughs> and there's a question here from Colleen Slade. So how can I modify basic soup to batch cook, but still have some variety for the fussy eaters? So, I mean, I, I do, I've, I've do this quite often. I'll make up two different soups and then I'll, and I'll make them up for my sort of lunches and I'll have yeah. free, freeze them and then I'll alternate. But if you want to have yeah, a bit more variety, is there a sort of basic soup that you could make that you could then use as a base, if you like? Well, it's, a, it's an interesting question. Um, first of all, I don't understand what a fussy eater might be. That could be anything. Is that someone that's all, wanting... All- all children a mess or just it doesn't like certain ingredients or whatever. I, I suspect it's probably all, all children. Uh, yeah. yeah. Yes, this could be, this could be, yeah. Or someone that doesn't like anything green, for instance, yes. or something like that. Um, the way I have approached that and the way I've approached it in the past um, is think of putting together a soup in modular steps. So you put together a broth first, and you just have that. You have that on hand. Then you can put together some vegetables, for instance. You can roast them. You can uh, blanch them. You can prepare them however you wish and just have those separate. You can have beans on on hand, even just opening a can of beans or making some beans. Um, You can cook some, uh, partially cook some pasta uh, and put it off to the side. The same thing with rice. You can use leftover rice, for instance, and have it off to the side. Then you have all of the piece parts to putting together basically a soup, which you can keep chunky and hearty. Or if you prefer, you can put all of those vegetables into the broth, bring it up uh, to a high temperature, and then just puree it. And then you have a whole different kind of soup um, that you're dealing with. So there's lots of different options when you think of soup in terms of modular components and then just putting them together um, sort of at the last minute based on your attitude, what other people like, uh, what you have on hand, that sort of thing. And if you did that effectively, you can really use a broth all week long and have a different soup every night. Mm -hmm. Um, And on the specific type of soup, is there a good way to make OMS compliant beasts and chowders that that would typically include dairy? Um, um, they don't all include dairy, do they? I, think, like, yeah, yes. I, I, I think that the simple answer to that is yes. Uh, the more complicated answer would be let's first uh, investigate what a bisque and chowder are for those that may may not know. So traditionally a bisque was made with um, shellfish, and it was uh, usually thickened with cooked rice, maybe a rice flour, or in some cases, bread, even toasted bread. And so it was basically this, uh, the broth that was made out of the shellfish, the shellfish uh, meat, if you will. Uh, And then it was just all cooked with a a rice, a starchy rice that would just basically uh, sort of dissolve into some sort of thickening agent. That's kind of what a bisque, a bisque is. Of course, these days, people refer to any sort of pureed soup as a bisque because they think it's a cool culinary term. <laughs> um, a chowder, on the other hand, is, uh, although most of them these days are made with milk or cream, traditionally they weren't. Uh, it's basically just going to be, again, it was traditionally made with seafood, always had some kind of pork product. Uh, potatoes and onions, and it was just sort sort of cooked together, um, utilizing the starch from the potatoes to sort of thicken the ingre- uh, to thicken the soup, um, and you'd have this sort of kind of hearty, chunky soup that has the seafood and the potatoes and and the other ingredients in it. So um, to make it OMS safe, if you wanted to make a bisque. Uh, The best way to do that is you start out by just taking your aromatics, which is usually just onions and carrots and celery, sometimes just onions, um, and just slowly cooking them in a little bit of of water or no um, liquid whatsoever, just to soften them. And that's really a crucial step. 
maybe adding a little bit of a tomato paste to keep it a little bit authentic. That was often done. And then you want to think in terms of how am I going to thicken the, the liquid once I get beyond that step. And that's usually done with a roux. And for those that don't know, a roux is equal parts fat and flour or starch uh, mixed in with the aromatics. Or you put some rice in, starchy rice, like a risotto rice works fabulously well for making a bisque. Um, in with the aromatic, start cooking it, adding your broth, um, and then it's pureed and strained, and then that's it. And then you finish it however you want to finish it. So that would be a, a typical way to make a bisque. A chowder, on the other hand, again starts, as most soups do, with sweating your aromatics. Now I use the term sweating, and a lot of people like to use the term uh, uh, water sauteing and that sort of thing. I prefer sweating, I think is a little bit more descriptive because really you're trying to encourage the liquid out of the vegetable and letting it sort of slowly stew in its own liquids rather than adding a lot of water uh, to the pot. So anyway, you, you, you sweat the aromatics, you add some vegetables, usually with uh, potato pieces. Uh, maybe it is just the potato cubed up. Um, and then you add uh, a fat and you make a roux as well. And again, maybe one or two tablespoons of, of, a, of an oil is enough and one or two tablespoons of uh, either flour or starch, either way. And then just adding your, uh, your broth and cooking it all up. You can add a little bit of plant-based cream or milk at the end if you want that sort of um, modern day look and feel of what a chowder might be. Um, and so that's how, that's how I would do it. And um, they're relatively simple and they're quite tasty, actually. Uh, so adding them, so you, you say dairy-free milk or cream at the end? To at do at it the that. end, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and I would tend to stick with something that's probably higher in, in fat content, uh, like a soya milk. Um, you could add a little bit of soy yogurt also. The danger there when you add the plant-based milks is for it to curdle, mm -hmm. uh, especially if you have an acid in there and mixed with the heat. So you definitely don't want to bring it up to a boil again after adding those. Okay, and this this is a question uh, that came from someone I know actually, Sue Alloway, um, and it's very interesting to me as well because I make soup with um, a saucepan and a blender. I think that's it. Yeah. <laughs> so th she's asking, what kitchen equipment would you recommend for soup making? Because I'm quite tempted by this. Uh, my mother actually has a, she has a soup maker. So you've got a number of different things, soup maker, a pressure cooker, a slow cooker, yeah. a saucepan, traditional, and a wonder bag, which I've not heard of. I don't yeah. know if you have. Um, yeah. And says, bearing in mind the cost of energy at present. Yeah. Um, which is a good point, actually, because some of these things, if it, if it's cooking away for hours, is that really expensive for electricity? Because we have to think about these things now. So, so yeah, which which equipment would you recommend and why? Well, um, the the first thing I would do is I would recommend a large pot. Um, and so, a large heavy bottom pot, uh, I think, is is the very first thing I would I would go for. It needs to have enough room for soup to expand. So you need to have it. I think somewhere uh, where it's going to contain up to five liters, which would be about five quarts, just so you can make enough at a time. I think it needs to be taller than wider. And the reason for that is a, a taller will control the amount of evaporation. Um, you do it a little bit slower. and You don't necessarily want all of the liquid to go out of the, the pot at once. So it's just that's the reason I would prefer and many restaurants as well have the taller soup pan as opposed to uh, wide, wider. What I find really important is a heavy bottom. Uh, so stainless steel works really well. Thin bottom pots tend to develop hot spots and that will scorch ingredients on the bottom. That becomes very important when you're using things like lentils or something of this nature that that likes to sink to the bottom. And if they grab onto one of those hot spots, they're gonna scorch, they're gonna burn, and basically that will ruin the flavor of the entire soup. Um, I think that's, that's, a, that's the place to start if you are interested in making soups. Um, helpful are spatulas, ladles. I find a handheld immersion blender quite useful. 
and making soups. They can usually puree really quickly uh, without a lot of mess. Um, of course, I use a blender as well. Food processor is sometimes helpful for chopping up vegetables and uh, a strainer, just a, a nice inexpensive strainer. Sometimes you want to, especially with cream soups, put it through a strainer to create sort of a velvety texture. Um, it's very elegant and it's, and it's quite nice. In terms of the other um, uh, pressure cooker, I've used um, to make soups, it will, it will bring you about a third of the time. So it will, it will speed up the process by about one third. It doesn't bring a huge amount in terms of making soups other than uh, just buys you a little bit more time. Um, that's, that's generally it. It will cook everything rather rapidly and the danger there is overcooking in a, in, with a pressure cooker. Um, slow cookers and Instapots and things like a Thermomix and that sort of thing. Um, that's basically when you're just, you know, you're, you're either going to work in stages like you would with a pot where you chuck everything in and turn it on and, and walk away, go to work. And when you come home, supposedly everything is done. The problem with that is it's going to cook things at different, at different points. So sometimes you want to cook ingredients uh, sh for a short period rather than a long period, just to maintain a, a, a texture. Um, sometimes you want to control the evaporation. Sometimes, you know, th there are points in the soup making process where maybe a pot is a little bit more effective than, uh, say, a slow cooker or an instant pot or something like that. But that's sort of minimal, and I think that's kind of dependent on everybody's sort of personal desire or or their schedule, or how much time they can actually spend in the kitchen. A lot of people think soups take forever to make. Some soups can you can make uh, from start to finish in less than a half hour, and uh, some soups do require a little bit more time, maybe uh, up to a couple of hours or something like that. But generally, it's not going to be much more than that. Um, the Wonder Bag is, is sort of an interesting thing. It's uh, I don't know where that was developed. Probably America. It sounds kind of American. Um, it's basically the idea is to keep the, the food hot. So if you're, if you're cooking your, your food, I don't know how long it keeps it hot, but basically it's this sort of odd looking bag that goes around and above and the top and, and bottom of, uh, of the soup container and it keeps everything hot. The problem is it also keeps it cooking. <laughs> and so once you think your soup is done, if you want to use that sort of product, um, to keep everything nice and hot, just keep in mind it's also cooking everything. So by the time you get to it, it might have overcooked everything. <laughs> right. Um, so the next one uh, from P Pam Shartner is a, a, an interesting one. What are some of your favorite OMS compliant Asian soups? Um, and she lists ramen, laksa, pho, miso, wonton, etc. cetera. Um, so I think, I mean, for me, all of them at different times. But, um, yeah, so you, you've um, selected D, all of the above? I yeah, think so I'm pretty keen on it. I, I've traveled yeah. a lot in Asia, so I'm, yeah, I'm pretty keen on it. I'd, I'd love like Viet, Vietnam where you're just going around mm. and people are making fresh pho. Um, yeah. You know, in, yeah, incredible. Yeah, I'm a big fan of, um, well, I'm a big fan of all types of soup, really. But with Asian soups, I tend to... Uh, when I'm making them, I tend to make uh, miso soup probably more than anything, although I do like a good ramen, and, and I'm pretty happy making a, a ramen as well. I think the key with uh, making a, a really tasty Asian-style uh, soup is, is the same could be said for pretty much all soups, is you really have to have a very tasty broth. That's a starting point. And uh, really use fresh ingredients and, and try as hard as you possibly can not to overcook anything. <laughs> um, and so I think that that's, that's kind of it. I mean, in Asian soups are going to have different flavoring ingredients. And so you're going to be using things like soya, like a soya sauce, for instance, maybe you might be using some different spices to, to bring out the flavors a little bit more. Maybe you make it spicy with adding chili and things like that. You might be using um, lemongrass or, um, you know, popular, of course, is coconut, um, but there are ways around that. And so you can um, get around the, the coconut issue rather simply. 
And you talk about the time as well. And we, we make RAM quite often. Um, mm -hmm. And it's really quick. If you've got the stock, then actually you don't overcook the vegetables. It's uh, and so exactly. a lot of the vegetables are actually added fresh. They're not even cooked. Exactly. Um, so, so what is it? Fifteen minutes? It's it's that, about yeah, like maybe ten. Yeah. yeah, it's really quick. <laughs> it is. It's just the same as making a pasta dish. In essence, it is the same. Yeah, and miso as well is. Um, I mean mm -hmm. that. It, I'm. I'm certainly not suggesting that people try and make their own miso paste. Um, I don't even know if that's possible. But uh, well, it's certainly possible, but I wouldn't recommend it either. It's a little bit involved. I mean, but it's so easy to just go buy the different misos, and there are many different kinds of miso available. Um, so it becomes sort of an interesting uh, prospect to mix and match different miso uh, products to create a different flavored soup. Of course, the important part in a miso soup is making a dashi at the beginning, and traditionally, dashi is made. Uh, with sort of a dried fish product, um, but there are m many different ways to make a vegan uh, dashi if, if you're not interested in having the fish element in there. Um, that's quite tasty as well. And uh, yeah, miso soup is fantastic. You can add whatever you want to it. I mean, a little bit of tofu, a little bit of uh, spinach leaves, um, spring onions, all those sorts of things, and you create a soup rather rapidly. And which is coming on to actually, what is the quickest and most nutritious <laughs> soup <laughs> also from Pam? I just gave that answer. Yeah, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think a ramen is, I mean, it is those sort yeah. of things because what is, I mean, it, you haven't overcooked, you, you've basically taken loads of fresh vegetables. I mean, it is, we just treat it as a really healthy meal because it's, a, it's like as many fresh vegetables and the kids eat it as well. They, um, exactly. And you know, is it because of the pasta, you think? In a ramen, um, so yeah, I mean, I don't know, I don't know. They, it's just, they just, I think, I think it's because they've been to restaurants and they say, oh, like, yeah, yeah. there's an Asian restaurant in the UK called Wagamama's, and they say, oh, they really like the ramen in there, and yeah. So I think it's coming from that. The noodles do have a, a a play in that, I think, but it's just the flavor as well. But I think you're right, uh, and it this just really gets to the whole core of making soup. It's it can be very rapid. Um, and taste very um, fresh, uh, be very nutritious. All of those elements come into play. It doesn't have to be anything that's really hugely involved, and it doesn't really take a lot of equipment to make a ramen either. <laughs> you know, a knife and a pot is basically all you're going to need. And uh, as far as, as, far as just, uh, I, I had another thought there, Jeff, yeah. um, on the nutritious soup. One of the soups I like to make is I use um, whole or split red or yellow lentils quite often to make soups. And, and those work really nicely because they completely cook and break down in about 30 minutes uh, when you cook them in a, in a liquid. And then they turn to this really nice creamy consistency, which you can leave and have a little bit of texture in your soup, or you can completely puree it and make it into something very smooth. You can add all kinds of different elements to that sort of uh, lentil soup, um, different spices, different vegetables added to them. Uh, sometimes even adding potato and, and some of them is really outstanding. Uh, it's just a lot of different ways. And of course, that's just a that's a fiber bomb with, with mm -hmm. lots of nutrition. Um, and, you, you know, when I make it, I make a big round and it will easily last the whole week. And you can, add, you know, we were talking about the batch cooking earlier. You can add different elements to it uh, during the week to change it completely. Um, and I just think it's just one of those types of soups that's very simple to make um, and really, really nutritious. And on the opposite side of this mm. so the opposite to the quickest soup mm. from Pam is what soups can be made in a slow cooker because so I think probably not just a slow cooker but I guess a soup maker would be a similar thing you know which ones could you just think okay all those ingredients and go in there I can leave it for the day come back what, um, what's a what, what do you uh, mean by a soup maker so we that? have things I don't know if they're international but you basically it has everything you need to make the soup so you've you've basically got a an electric pot that you put all of your uncooked vegetables in you follow an ingredient you know, ingredients some water mm -hmm. and everything in there you shut it up you turn it on and you either do it straight away or you put it on a timer and then it cooks the vegetables and it has a blender as well 
mm-hmm. and they typically have different settings so you could have it either completely smooth or you could have it chunky or mm-hmm. and so it will cook everything and it will blend everything at the end of it the soup's ready but everything has been cooked for exactly the same amount of time yeah which could or could not be a problem in some cases. So, this, so I, I think they probably come with. I mean, I said my my mother's got one of the swears by it yeah. because the recipe books they have with them obviously suggest things that work for things that yeah. cook for exactly the same amount of time. It sounds a little bit like a thermomix. In, in yes, kind of but yeah, right. I mean, it doesn't do as much. It is just it would just do yeah. soup, and that's it. Yeah, so I don't have any of that in my kitchen. Uh, so I'm not a hundred percent up on on the pluses and minuses and making uh, soups and all of those. For me, I think there there are some keys in making a great tasting um, soup, which always comes to mind. And maybe you sacrifice some of that in in using some of these uh, this technology. Uh, for instance, getting the initial aromatics and vegetables properly sweated that's very very key and the reason that's really important is uh, it starts to build the initial layer of flavor and so if you're sweating off some onions or or carrots and then you get the spices in there after the vegetables have softened the flavor of those spices actually goes right into the vegetable it penetrates it and that's what's creating a lot of that um, really uh, intensive flavor that might be in the background uh, but nonetheless, it, it's very important. Adding oil. Now, I know um, some people like to cook without oil, but when you're working with spices, sometimes the spice needs an oil um, in it to help with the um, the properties of the spice that's being released into the food. That oil will trans. Uh, transplant that flavor throughout. So it it sort of acts as a little bit of a vehicle, but sometimes also uh, you want to add a little bit of fat uh, for those uh, fat soluble um, uh, bits of nutrition that might be in the vegetables or in the other spices and whatnot. I think cooking um, the fresh and uh, ingredients, yeah, sometimes you might want to add them at different points. And so I, I struggle to see how that works with a slow cooker when I mean, you're basically putting everything in there at once. Um, so you you would just have the same kind of texture rather than some different textures in a soup, which for some are fine. That's fine. Um, you know, and it's one of those things you just kind of have to, to weigh. Um, but I think that you can do all of those things in a pot uh, initially create the the base and then if you want you can actually finish the soup all in a slow cooker if you need to go to work or whatever um or from my perspective just leave it in the pot and just you know it's only going to take about another hour at that point anyway um so i don't know uh, i think that that's one of those decisions that everybody has to kind of make on their own uh based on their own unique circumstances and how much time they have in the day and all of those sorts of elements. Okay. And um, also from Carleen, do you have any ideas of accompaniments to soups other than bread? Because quite a lot of people are um, gluten intolerant. They, and, and certainly there is an element that if you have a lot of soup, you could end up eating a lot of bread because it is the obvious thing to have with soup. You mean uh, like a crouton to put on top um, of it? Like I, mean, I mean, I so so um, I quite often have uh, soup and I'll, I'll have bread just to dip into the soup. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, if I'm having a soup which is zero carbohydrates, then quite often it'll be uh, just a mm. uh, French baguette that I'll be dipping bits in. Yeah, I kind of do that myself. Um, it depends, I suppose, on the soup. Um, you know, creamy soups, you'd probably want to do that a little bit more with. And Something that's going to be chunky, you know, some kind of hearty minestrone or something like that. Probably don't need any sort of bread to go along with that. If we're talking about garnishes or if the question is kind of getting to that point, there's certainly lots of ways to to finish a soup uh, from chopped er herbs to um, squeeze a lemon juice or maybe some zest and, you know, a little bit of Black pepper or ground uh, fresh nutmeg on top of a soup is often quite nice. You can use plant-based cream or yogurt. Uh, sometimes works uh, very nice. Uh, for bean soups, it's especially nice to put a little bit of, uh, uh, for those that, that want to, a little bit of uh, extra virgin olive oil on top and then maybe some 
nutritional yeast or some kind of faux parmesan that you've come up with uh, sprinkled on top. Sometimes just pesto in a soup is is fabulous. I know in the south of France, they tend to do that a lot. Um, or just if a, it's a vegetable soup that's featuring a specific kind of vegetable, uh, use that vegetable as part of the garnish, you know, chop up a little bit, cook it separately. Um, I make a corn chowder and I like to garnish it with just pieces of uh, cooked corn kernels, um, which is fa fantastic. Sometimes I mix it with some uh, chanterelle mushrooms also, but that kind of thing. And there's lots of different ways, but if you want to get away from bread, yeah, maybe think crackers instead of bread. You know, it, there's lots of ways to make them gluten-free if gluten is an issue. Uh, but but sometimes that's that's actually quite nice as well. You can even crumble them into the soup. Mm -hmm. And um, a question from Vicky adams Hodge. I This could be a challenging one. I used to love a thick and hearty beef stew. Do you have any suggestions on getting that thick and umami stick to your ribs flavor and texture from an OMS compliant stew? <laughs> oh, I love that question. Um, I also like the way it's phrased, you know, that stick to your ribs kind of thing. Um, yeah, um, he, here's what I do. So the first thing you want to do is, okay, a stew basically is going to be the same as a, as a soup, right? It just is, has a different amount of liquid in it that's going to be a thicker consistency. And so that would be more of a stew. Um, but if you wanted to make it really that as she put it, that stick to your ribs kind of consistency, you need to have a very rich broth. Um, and it needs to be something with color. So I make a, uh, uh, what I call an umami broth, um, which I'll drop the uh, recipe or a link to the recipe in the show notes. But, but in essence, what I'm doing is I'm making a very easy kind of vegetable broth. And then I've just packed it with as much umami flavor as possible using dried mushrooms, uh, mushroom powder. I use some soy sauce in there. I use a little bit of miso in there. And it turns out very, very dark uh, and actually has quite a meaty flavor to it. Um, the next question is, is how am I going to thicken that? Because it's the consistency of a normal broth. It's liquid. Um, ideally for a stew, uh, you want to use something that's uh, like a roux. And, and you can do it with a starch, but the reason why you'd want to do it with a roux is a roux is more robust and will hold up better with uh, uh, longer periods of cooking. Um, also, if there's an acid in there, a roux will hold better, or if you're reheating it, so you made more than you can eat, uh, which hopefully you did, and the next day you want to reheat it, a roux will hold up better on that reheating than just a starch base, like thickening it with cornstarch or something of that nature. Um, and then you just cook all of your ingredients in that thickened sauce. Ironically, I just wrote about this uh, yesterday, I think, in my newsletter, where I uh, uh, shared a way of making a mushroom uh, bourguignon. So a bourguignon is typically made with beef, but I just did it with mushrooms, and I did exactly this with my umami broth and thickened it with a roux and had some uh, roasted carrots in there along with the mushrooms and uh, these little uh, pearl onions that went in there. And it was just, it, it, it's exactly as Vicky uh, uh, described it. If you eat it, it's thick and uh, it's very satisfying. And it's that kind of stick to your ribs sort of <laughs> concept that, that maybe she was getting at. And now uh, the final question um, is saying there's a, a, from Marta Humphreys. It's uh, there's a lot of information about how beneficial bone broth is. Um, now I've come across this because I um, have started um, fasting um, to, like a day a week, and the, and one of the things looking into the information about that is they say you can have bone broth um as something to help you get through fasting because it doesn't have any carbohydrates and doesn't have any sugars and those are the things you're trying to avoid i mean I, i'm not doing that I'm, I'm literally just going one day with water and black coffee and nothing else um but people and, and some people are doing much longer fasts you know people doing three day four day five day fasts and so that idea and, and there are obviously there, there must be some nutrients in bone broth as well you can make it with um 
various different bones, including fish bones. But she's saying, how could you make an OMS compliant version when sourcing fish bones can be very tricky? Yeah. Um, first of all, is it, it, uh, my first question would be, is the animal even important? Is that element really even important? What's it bringing in terms of any sort of nutrition uh, within, the, within the broth? For me, I would prefer to do something more vegetable based, uh, perhaps exactly what I was just referring to with my umami broth, which is going to give you that deep, rich flavor, um, as well as all of those other wonderful uh, fermented elements and the vegetable element that's in there. Um, so I would find that far more nutritious than something that is made with, with bones. Um, the other part of the bone broth equation that I think that we often overlook in this discussion as to whether it's good or not is the fact that um, maybe if you take out the anti the um, um, uh, inflammation element maybe if you take out the there is no fat so you're going to be taking that out and so you just say well what why not why couldn't we have it well unfortunately in this day and age most of them is made with beef and beef these days are going to be fed a quite a significant diet of antioxidants, um, whether that's in their feed or indirectly, that's a big problem. And that has been shown to uh, go right into the broth if you're making it. And so I, I tend to stay away from, from it for that particular reason or, or one of the reasons why I would. Um, and the same thing that would apply with fish. And fish isn't necessarily although farm fish will have the antioxidant, uh, anti, uh, um, what's the word I want? Biotics? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And um, uh, that will occur in fish feed as well. Um, but the bigger problem with fish is going to be the microplastics. Um, and that's also going to come through in a broth. And that's been shown to be true. So you're not going to be uh, cooking that out in any way or straining it out in any way. And I really don't want to put a lot of plastic in my blood. Okay, right. I think um, that's definitely um, covered quite a lot of things. I think it, it, yeah, I mean, personally, I think yeah, soups are a, a great OMS compliant yeah. food. And, and I, one thing I would say just personally is you can just try stuff out. Um, exactly. I mean, I, I made, so last week I made a soup just because, I'd heard it, I was in a soup, it was a tin soup in a supermarket, it said spicy lentil and red pepper soup. So I thought, okay, I'm, I just basically took some uh, red peppers, put them in the oven um, with some tomatoes, and I actually put the onions, chopped the onions up, put them in the oven as well, I just put it all in the oven, and um, and, and literally just cooked that up, um, added some lentils, added some, um, it said smoky on their one, so I added some liquid smoke as well. Um, I think mm. I added a bit of chili. Um, delicious. Absolutely, yes. And it, yeah. just trying stuff out, I think, just thinking, oh, that exactly. sounds nice in there. In a soup, it kind of works because it's all blended together anyway, so you, you can just exactly. think what works there. And I would just add to that, Jeff, don't make a big deal out of the broth. The broth helps enormously. Um, and from my perspective, it can also uh, bring a lot of, negative to the soup if you're using a poor quality uh, cube or powder or something like that. And so in those instances, just use water. Uh, you know, you can even make them with other other types of liquids. Just let your imagination run, run free on that. But um, there's nothing wrong with making a, a soup with just using water and letting the ingredients that are in the soup speak for themselves. Um, I think that that's perfectly okay. Okay, thank you very much for joining us, Jack. Yeah, you're welcome. I really appreciate it and look forward to the next one, Jeff. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this episode of Ask Jack. Please check out this episode's show notes at overcomingms.org slash podcast, where you'll find all sorts of useful links and bonus information. If you'd like to submit a question for a future episode of Ask Jack, please email us at podcast at overcomingms.org. You can also subscribe to Living Well with MS on your favourite podcast platform so you never miss an episode of any of our podcasts. Ask Jack is kindly supported by a grant from the Happy Charitable Trust. 
If you'd like to support the Overcoming MS charity and help keep our podcast advertising free, you can donate online at overcomingms.org slash donate. To learn more about Overcoming MS and its array of free content and programs, including webinars, recipes, exercise guides, OMS circles, our global network of community support groups, and more, please visit our website at overcomingms.org. While you're there, don't forget to register for our monthly e-newsletter so you can stay informed about the podcast and other news and updates from Overcoming MS. Thanks again for tuning in and see you next time. The Living Well with MS family of podcasts is for private non-commercial use and exists to educate and inspire our community of listeners. We do not offer medical advice. For medical advice, please contact your doctor or other licensed healthcare professional. Our guests are carefully selected, but all opinions they express are solely their own and do not necessarily reflect the views or opinions of the Overcoming MS charity, its affiliates or staff.